This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Dr. Leah Kelly. I'm the medical director of the breast oncology program at Marin General Hospital and a breast surgeon there. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about breast cancer in Marin. I know you had a little bit of a breast cancer talk last week. Um, so this will dovetail on some of the things that Dr. Goldman taught you. Um, and we're going to specifically focus on Marin as sort of a microcosm of what's going on with breast cancer epidemiology in Northern California and in the United States in general. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the risk factors for breast cancer and get into some of the studies that help to support uh, what we know about what's going on with breast cancer rates in Marin and some of the questions that we still have uh, that we're working on. These are questions that my patients ask me all the time. Right? I see a big uh, variety of women in Marin, and so I put this talk together in part for them to uh, try to help people understand what their modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors were so that they could have some agency over those things that could be changed. The one question, of course, that my patients uh, ask me every day that I don't answer and can't answer and will not be able to answer for you tonight is that big one, which is why. Why does breast cancer happen to one particular woman and not another? Why does Susan get it and not Jane? Um, and these are the million dollar questions, of course, that we struggle with um, as we go through our, um, our practice um, and the things that our research uh, arms are busily looking at. So we're gonna focus on a range of different risk factors and look at how they fit together in a bigger epidemiologic picture, um, but the the answer to the why question, of course, is it's complicated, right? Um, cancer is incredibly complicated. Um, you may have seen a recent New York Times article highlighting some recent research looking at the very high rate of random genetic mutations in most garden variety cancers. Um, and that was just really highlighting what we have come to understand, which is that virtually all cancers, while they may be promoted by various risk factors, are essentially random events. Uh, our cells are incredibly complex structures. They're finely tuned machines. They grow, they divide, they differentiate, they communicate with each other, they stop when they're supposed to, start when they're supposed to, and they're generally incredibly well behaved. Um, some of the examples, just kind of thinking off the top of your head, of ways that you can see our cells be well behaved and be regulated are, for example, what happens from an embryo to an eight pound baby to a 25 pound toddler to a 50 pound fifth grader. The amount of cellular division and motion and differentiation that's happening in that process is just mind boggling. That's all highly, highly regulated. Those regulatory systems can and do break down. And that's where the issues around cancer come to the fore. Um, our cells can make mistakes. Um, and like most accidents, these mistakes are not one event. Um, they're more like a car accident, right? A car accident doesn't just happen because somebody is texting behind the wheel, right? There also has to be a rainy day or the brakes that are hitting just at the wrong point or the attention being at the wrong place at the wrong time or the light going yellow just a second too late. 
there's always a multifactorial picture when you have an accident. Anybody who's had a car accident or a bike accident can attest to that. If you think about that moment where all those things went wrong at once and the outcome wasn't what you expected. And the same thing is really going on on the level of our cells. They have all kinds of defense mechanisms that are there to prevent these kinds of things from happening. And when accidents happen, it's because there's been a confluence of complex events that lead to an unexpected outcome. So with that in mind, we're going to turn to our discussion of risk factors. Um, and I frame it that way in part to help us resist the urge of sort of checking the boxes on our own risk factors as we talk about them, because there's no simple math problem here. Um, we all know many people who have risk factors for certain cancers, like smoking, who never get it, um, and those who don't have that risk factor who do get some terrible disease, right? So when we talk about risk factors, we want to resist thinking of them as a simple addition problem and put them in the context of this very complex regulatory cellular structure that's happening in every cell in our body day in and day out throughout our lifetime. So breast cancer in Marin is a complex topic for all of these reasons. Um, and it's also a, a complex topic politically. There was in the 1980s and 90s what looked like a true epidemic of breast cancer in Marin. There was a big spike in cases. And at a time when breast cancer was just beginning to be something you could even talk about in the mainstream media, women in Marin were terrified. They were feeling that their friends were dropping like flies and no one was doing any research or, or paying attention. So uh, the groundswell of advocacy came out of that um, and has been one of the big players on the national scene in terms of ad advocacy for uh, breast cancer research um, and for breast cancer patients. Um, and so there's been, as a result of that, some really unique research done about Marin and in Marin County trying to answer the question of why this was happening. So we're going to put this in context. This is a great visual that shows you the context of Marin County compared to countries around the globe. Um, you'll note that Marin County, of course, has the highest incidence of any of these areas. This is raw incidence, right? So this is number of cases per 100,000 people in the population per year. Um, so this is about 118 uh, per 100,000. As we go through the talk, I'm going to harp a little bit on statistics and we'll break, break them down in a variety of ways because I find that one of the sources of the greatest amount of misunderstanding when we talk about cancer epidemiology is misunderstanding of statistics. So forgive me for getting a little bit into the weeds about those things, but I think it's quite helpful to understand those things. Um, a couple of things about this number. There are only 260,000 people in Marin, right? So this is obviously uh, an adjusted number, right? This is absolute incidence. Um, it is, this is not age-adjusted incidence. Um, so you have to take this number with a little bit of a grain of salt. This is mainly for comparison purposes. Note also the date. This is from 1997, so this is fairly old data. The incidence has come down somewhat in the last 10 years, um, but this is the comparison that we have. This is a look closer to home, looking at Marin in comparison to other California counties. All right, so these are all the little green dots, California counties. And you can see, if your eyes are good enough, that San Francisco County is third down on the list. All right, so pretty close, but not anywhere near Marin, statistically. All right, so this was, again, one of these eye-popping things that was appeared in the late 90s. Again, this is late 90s data. Um, and cancer epidemiology data always lags by about three or four years. So this is data that we were looking at in the early 2000s, seeing this really, really remarkably high incidence compared to other counties in, Marin, in uh, California, even comparable socioeconomic counties like San Francisco County. So when we're asking this question, why were the breast cancer rates or why are the breast cancer rates in Marin so high, we have to think a little bit about what's going on, what's packed into that question. First of all, we have to think about the population. Populations fluctuate. People come and go. The population of Marin has not been stable over the last 20 or 30 years. It's gone up and down, and populations come and go. Risk factor reporting can be quite variable. We don't always know exactly that we're getting the real story when we ask people about risk factors, especially where they relate to lifestyle issues. Risk factors can interact with one another. And most importantly, 
association is not causation. So we have to be very, very careful about assuming that because everybody on my street wears blue sweaters that there's something on my street that's causing people to wear blue sweaters, right? It's, there's a very careful uh, separation that you have to make between seeing two events in parallel and assuming them to be causing each other or one of them to be causing the other. A great uh, example of this in the breast cancer world is the example of socioeconomic status. So multiple studies looking at incidence of breast cancer have identified higher socioeconomic status as a risk factor for breast cancer, and more developed countries with higher GDPs have significantly higher rates of breast cancer than less developed countries with lower GDPs. So it's obviously not our household or national GDPs that are causing the DNA damage that leads us to have breast cancer. So that's an association that can't be a causation, but must be a proxy for other risk factors that are either not identified or not unpacked from that. Um, so that's a great example. Um, so one of the first things that these studies asked is, is living in Marin an independent risk factor for breast cancer, or is it related to other packed-in risk factors? Could it be something in the water? Could it be something coming over from the Richmond refinery? Could it be the hormones in the milk? You know, there were a lot of theories that people had about what was going on in the county when this research started in the early 2000s. There were two main studies that were established in Marin. Uh, one was established by the, uh, the Health and Human Services Division. Um, that was the Marin Adolescent Risk Factor Study. And this was a case control study looking at uh, a group of women who had breast cancer and a group of women who did not, and looking at their self-reported adolescent risk factors. They matched them for age and ethnicity, and they looked at a whole range of factors, including things like family history, their mammogram history, uh, their years living in Marin, how long they, or how soon they had moved to Marin compared to when their age when they were uh, first diagnosed. Uh, and so on. The only differences that they found between these two groups had to do with uh, high socioeconomic status in childhood, so before age 21, women who came from more affluent backgrounds did have higher risk, um, and again, that's a proxy for we're not sure exactly what, um, and alcohol intake over, three, over two drinks a day um, in adolescence, again. Um, so these were the things that came out of that study that were our first clues as to what might be going on in younger women. Uh, there are some ongoing, there's some, some ongoing work done, being done with adolescents in Marin, looking in particular at levels of physical activity and uh, body fat percentages at various ages, um, correlating to, along with some research about uh, onset of puberty, and looking at that prospectively in relationship to breast cancer risk later in life, um, and that research is ongoing. The Marin Women's Study was a much larger study. It was established in 2006. Um, there were more than 14,000 women who participated, most of whom filled out questionnaires at the time of their mammography. Um, and also, many of them provided saliva samples. Um, the saliva samples are all stored at the Buck Institute in Novato, and there's quite a lot of active research going on um, in that, uh, with those samples um, and in the, the steering committee that runs the Marin Women's Study. They looked for information on a whole variety of some of the risk factors that we've talked about um, and uh, were interested in knowing whether any of those things were more active in Marin. So we're going to go through some of the data from the Marin Women's Study um, and look at what it showed us. So one of the things we always look at, of course, is race and ethnicity. Um, and this shows the r rates of breast cancer in different ethnic groups in Marin County. Now, again, this is incidence per 100,000. Right? So this is how many Asian American women would get breast cancer if 100,000 of them lived in Marin County. Right? But again, we're dealing with a population of only about 200, 260 and 280,000. So these are all derived numbers. Um, but you can see that there's a significantly higher rate of uh, breast cancer for most of the years that we're looking at in non-Hispanic white women. And this is important when we look at the incidence in Marin County because Marin County is 72% white um, and uh, has uh, a very low Asian population, which has a much lower 
rate compared to, for example, a city, a city like San Francisco. It's only about 6% of the population in Marin that's Asian. So for whatever reason that there's an association with ethnicity and breast cancer, that's one of the reasons that we're seeing a higher incidence in Marin County. Another reason is that Ashkenazi Jewish women are, for a variety of complex genetic reasons, at increased risk for breast cancer. Um, and they comprise over 7% of the Marin County population compared to just uh, above 1% uh, of the US population. So that's another contribution of race and ethnicity to the complex math problem that we're trying to do here. Body mass index was another thing that we looked pretty carefully at in the Marin Women's Study. And this continues to be a subject of some research. Now, overweight and obesity is a risk factor that's actually not more common in Marin compared to other counties in California. In fact, the rate of overweight and obesity is a little bit lower in Marin than in many parts of the state. However, nationally, the rates of overweight and obesity have significantly increased over the last couple of decades, and that's been true in Marin, relatively speaking, just as it has been all over the country. Um, we know that there's an association between obesity and increased risk of breast cancer, and you can see that in this graph where body mass index is on the lower uh, level and then uh, risk, relative risk of breast cancer is on the, uh, the y-axis. Um, you can see the increased incidence associated uh, as you go from a normal BMI up to the obese BMI. So just for uh, Clarity's purpose, uh, BMI is something you've probably heard of. This is the body mass index. Uh, that's a, a, a calculation that includes both weight and height um, and is an effort to even out some of the natural variation between people in terms of body habit and give us a concrete quantifiable number that we can use to compare um, body mass between individuals. So this is what we typically use when we're doing research about obesity. So what's the relationship here? The main relationship is the role of uh, fat tissue in estrogen production. Um, so especially after menopause, when our ovaries basically stop making the estrogen that they were when we were in our, in our reproductive years, um, our fatty tissue is the primary source of our circulating estrogens. Um, and they're made uh, by changing our circulating androgens, which we make in our adrenal glands, into estrogen. The more fatty tissue you have, the more endogenous natural estrogens you're making. Um, there are a number of other hypothetical links to the increased risk of not just breast cancer, but many other types of cancers um, with obesity. And this include things like chronic low-level inflammation, um, production of circulating insulin and insulin growth factors. Um, fat cells make a variety of growth, cell growth promoting factors called adipokines, um, which promote the, the division of cells around them. Um, so these are some of the things that are probably playing a role. Interestingly, the distribution of body mass index during the age or among, along the lifespan makes a difference in terms of how much it contributes to breast cancer risk. Younger, heavier women are actually slightly protected against getting breast cancer before menopause for reasons that we don't really understand. However, obesity in postmenopausal women becomes a major risk factor. Independently, women who gain weight during their reproductive years between 18 and 50 have a significant increased risk in de of developing breast cancer at any point in their lifespan. So there are some complex metabolic things that are going on here um, that continue to be the subject of a lot of research. But this is obviously one of the big contributors um, to the gradual, continuous rise of breast cancer rates nationally, and in particular um, in Marin, this was one of the contributors that we were looking for. Hormone replacement therapy also turned out to be a big player in Marin County. So this is very interesting statistically, so we're going to get into it for just a, just a minute. Medical estrogens, of course, have been used since the 1950s for a variety of reasons, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we started prescribing them at large scales. Um, they were prescribed originally for menopausal symptoms, um, but women felt great on them and loved them, so there was a whole set of theories brought forth about how they were going to be the fountain of youth and keep women from getting heart disease and keep women from getting osteoporosis and so on and so forth. Um, as often happens, this got a little bit ahead of the science. So the clinical practice of prescribing hormone replacement therapy to postmenopausal women um, became widespread before there was much safety data uh, or much data to really guide us in terms of long-term health outcomes, even the ones for which the treatment was being promoted, like improved uh, heart health. 
there were two major studies, um, and their, uh, their date of release is marked on this uh, graph as HERS and WHI. HERS is a large British study uh, that looked at the cardiac effects of hormone replacement therapy under the hypothesis that this would improve heart outcomes and actually turned out to be a negative study, showed no benefit at all, no detriment, but no benefit. Um, and so that was really the first time that we realized that probably weren't doing as much good as we thought with hormone replacement therapy. The WHI was a much larger American study um, that's collected so much data, they're still publishing papers um, looking at hormone replacement therapy use after menopause and a variety of other endpoints. Uh, their first major findings were published in 2001 um, and showed an increased risk of invasive breast cancer in postmenopausal women who used combined hormone replacement therapy, both estrogen and progesterone, for more than five years after menopause. Uh, they also found an increased risk in clots and strokes in those women and no improvement in their heart health. The only benefit that they found was that there was an increased uh, or better bone density uh, for many of those women. Um, so that's sort of, it, it's a lot, there's a lot of data in that study, but that's kind of the general summary slide about it. This, of course, was big news. Um, interestingly, we were able to document through the Marin Women's Study that Marin uh, citizens quit using hormone replacement therapy essentially en masse and went from about 25% of the population using uh, combined hormone replacement therapy after menopause to under 10% in a very short period of time. Here you can see that same graph, the graph on the bottom that we were just looking at, superimposed on the breast cancer rates in Marin and California over that same period of time. So this is one of these rare moments where you actually get to see epidemiology in action, right? We quit using hormone replacement therapy in large numbers and breast cancer rates dropped essentially simultaneously. Um, this is a kind of amazing looking data, but it was replicated all around the country. Um, and so this was very clearly something that was at play in Marin. Um, couple of things about this. This looks like a huge change um, because of the way the graph is done, but it only represents about 20 to 30 cases per year difference. Now, for those 20 to 30 women, that's a really, really big difference. Um, but from an epidemiologic standpoint, this is a fairly minor change in the total number of national breast cancer cases, um, but it was definitely big enough that we could measure it statistically. And again, coming back to the question of why were breast cancer rates in Marin so high, there was not only a relatively high use of hormone replacement therapy in the county, there was also a relatively larger proportion of women using combined hormone replacement therapy, both estrogen and progesterone, rather than estrogen alone. Now, going back to the Women's Health Initiative, they had an arm of that study that showed that looked at estrogen alone as postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy in women who had had a hysterectomy and therefore did not need the progesterone to help protect their uterine lining. Right? And we found that those women did not have the same measurable increase in their risk for invasive breast cancer. Across California, the rate of hysterectomies can be as high as 62% of women in a county. That's a lot, right? Whereas in Marin, and again, this is fairly old data, um, it was actually higher than you would think, but, but mar markedly lower, right? So about 30%, right? So, this means that proportionally, the women in Marin who were taking hormone replacement therapy were taking combined hormone replacement therapy at much higher rates, thereby placing themselves in that risk group. This really has to do primarily with cultural factors, right? So the rates of hysterectomy are dictated in part by medical indications, but probably more importantly by medical culture, um, as well as uh, the broader culture and those complex interactions, of course, between uh, physician and patient where you make choices about surgery. Um, that's really what was driving this. Next risk factor we really looked at in Marin County was alcohol consumption. Now, there have been several big meta-analyses looking at uh, alcohol consumption and its contribution to breast cancer uh, risk. These are pretty difficult studies to do because unlike something like the WHI where you can randomize people to take estrogen or not, it's hard to randomize people to have a certain amount of alcohol or not. Uh, 
And additionally, it can be pretty difficult to collect this data in a way that's reliable, right? People are notoriously prone to fudging um, the answers to questions like how much alcohol are you consuming, how much are you smoking, and so on. Um, so this data can be very difficult to, to collect accurately. Um, and when we see big swings in the reported increase in risk associated with these, we have to assume that there's some uh, bias in the data reporting. The big meta-analysis that we have to go on uh, shows that alcohol increases breast cancer risk by six to seven percent per extra drink per day, right? Um, so you can add that up. The main difference we saw looking at Marin County was that a significantly higher proportion of citizens of the county reported active alcohol use compared to the average in California. Um, and that, again, is cultural and has to do with proximity to the wine country. Um, it's probably one of the things that's associated with socioeconomic status as a complex risk factor, um, but it certainly was a big player as we did this math problem in Marin. So the initial data from the Marin Women's Study really helped us to understand what the main risk factors were in the county. Um, when you compile these risk factors, when you look at socioeconomic status, ethnicity, alcohol consumption, hormone replacement therapy use, those are the main players in Marin, and that adds up to almost all of the additional attributable risk in the county. So it's definitely not the water, it's definitely not the Richmond refinery. There have been a couple of really good studies looking at the placement of cases in Marin County, arguing against uh, any kind of environmental cause. Um, and so as I tell my patients, this is really a demographic and not a geographic problem. Um, Marin County could be located anywhere in the country, it's who lives there um, and the risk factors that they bring with them uh, to the table. Just briefly to give you a little sense of what's going on next in the Marin Women's Study, we are focusing on the effects of pregnancy and breastfeeding on health later in life. We know that pregnancy and breastfeeding uh, choices uh, make a difference in breast cancer risk. What we don't really know is why. Um, and so we're focusing on the interplay between pregnancy, breastfeeding, and breast density, which is also a risk factor for breast cancer, um, looking at some of the ways that people's underlying genotype, um, their sort of basic uh, genetic makeup, affects the way they respond to something like pregnancy. And we found that there are several different genotypes in the uh, insulin growth factor gene that uh, can show us how a woman is likely to respond to a pregnancy. If she has a certain genotype, the pregnancy, especially if she has high blood pressure during it, is going to decrease her breast density and decrease her breast cancer risk. If she has a different genotype, that same event is not going to make a bit of difference in her risk. And if we're able to understand the difference between those genotypes, then we may be able to devise ways to turn on that effect um, and help women who don't have a pregnancy or have a pregnancy at a different time in their lives or have a different genotype achieve the same effect. So this is some of the research that we're really uh, looking to uh, as the next step, um, trying to find ways to uh, prevent these events from occurring in the first place. So again, Living in Marin is not a risk factor for breast cancer. This is one of the things I like to tell my patients. The geography is an association, not a causation, um, and the increased prevalence is due to known risk factors in the population. Um, interestingly, there may be some gene environment interactions. Um, there was a very small study released a little while back looking at the prevalence of variant vitamin D receptors in the population in Marin, um, hypothesizing that maybe for whatever population-based reason, there were more women in the county who had an abnormal or variant receptor for vitamin D and that they weren't getting the same effect from their normal circulating vitamin D and that that might be playing a role. Uh, that data has not been replicated and it was a small study, but it suggested well, what we're often looking to, which is the complexity of gene environment interactions to say, who's living here? How are they being impacted by their environment, including their cultural and social environment? I mean, how might that be playing a role? So the remainder of this talk is very much more practically focused. Um, I like to look at a case and just sort of walk through what we're doing with uh, women in the screening setting in Marin to try to identify those people who may be at increased risk and to begin to modify those risk factors or find ways to 
decrease stage of diagnosis, decrease treatment burden, and improve uh, both cure rates um, and rates of overall prevention, lower rates of disease. So I know you guys learned a lot about breast cancer screening guidelines last week. Um, this gave me a little bit of a, a chuckle, and I think we mostly all feel this way when we're confronted with the maze of rules and regulations about what we're supposed to be doing uh, to keep ourselves healthy. So I'm going to just frame this by talking about a case. This is my uh, Marin woman. Um, she's 42 years old. Uh, she does have a family history of breast cancer. Her mother had breast cancer at 54 um, and is doing well after treatment at age 69. Uh, she has two children um, who were born when the first one was born when she was 33 and she did breastfeed them. Um, and she's never had a mammogram. She's a busy mom. She's been running around hither and yon. Um, but she came to her doctor figuring that it was time for her to get checked out for breast cancer risk. So one of the most common misconceptions I see in my practice is if I don't have a family history, then I'm not at risk for breast cancer. I hear this a lot, um, especially from tragically, heartbreakingly, from my newly diagnosed patients who say, but, but I don't have a family history. And the truth is that about 80% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer every year have no family history. Um, and so that's a great misconception that that's one of the main risk factors because, in fact, it's relatively low on the list in terms of how much it impacts risk with some exceptions. Um, that said, um, that's one of the things that we look for when we identify women at, as being at high risk. So we always ask about those things. Um, so the first thing that Marina's doctor is going to tell her is to go and get a mammogram. So here's one of the other things that my patients tell me is that they think that mammograms cause breast cancer. So this, unfortunately, is a terrible piece of misinformation that gets circulated quite a lot. Um, and the, the questions that are brought up are really, um, I think, va very valid ones. Is mammography really safe? Uh, should we start screening at 40? Should we start screening at 50? How often should we be screened? Are there any real risks to being screened? And these are really valid questions that, of course, we're interested in, in knowing the answer to. Um, Unfortunately, we get hung up, I think, publicly sometimes on sort of red herrings around where the risk is. In particular, the risk of about radiation exposure being uh, playing a role in increasing breast cancer risk if you get mammograms. So we'll talk about radiation exposure from mammograms for just a second. Dr. Goldman may have talked about this a little bit too. Um, the radiation exposure from a single screening mammogram is extremely low. You get exposed to more tissue radiation by getting in a plane and flying to New York, just by background cosmic ray radiation that's in our environment all the time. Medical radiation can be a very serious issue. For example, a CT scan exposes you to a pretty whopping dose of radiation. Here's an interesting math problem. If a woman has a screening mammogram, Every year from the year she's 40 to the year she's 80, 40 screening mammograms, she still gets a cumulative dose of radiation to her breast lower than if she got one CT scan. Right. So when you think about medical radiation, remember that it's on a huge spectrum um, and that all by itself, the amount of radiation exposure that you get from a single mammogram is so little that it's essentially background risk. Um, the risks that are really associated with mammography that we really know about have a lot more to do with um, false positives and false negatives. So again, this may be something that you heard a little bit about last week, but we're going to get into that uh, just a little bit. Um, we know that, I'm going to go back up just a little bit and finish something else that I wanted to tell you. We know that early detection can decrease breast cancer specific mortality, right? So meaning the chance that an individual woman is going to die, not, not just get breast cancer, but die of her breast cancer um, by 30 to 35%, which is an enormous amount of benefit. And that's a bigger benefit than any other screening test we routinely recommend, um, including things like colonoscopy and pap smears. Um, so it still remains one of the best screening tests we've ever devised, um, not to say that it doesn't have its limitations. It does not work equally well for every woman, right? So there are both false positives and false negatives. Breast density is one of the biggest causes of false negatives. 
So sidebar breast density is also an independent risk factor for breast cancer. Um, and it's one of the least well studied and least well understood of the risk factors for breast cancer. Probably has to do with the micro environment, microcellular environment within the breast. What we do know about breast density is that it can very much decrease the sensitivity of mammography. So sensitivity is a number that tells us out of 100 women who walk through the door with a breast cancer that they don't know about, how many of those will we be able to find? And generally with mammography, that number is somewhere in the 80 to 85 percent range. If you isolate the women with very high de breast density, that number is going to be somewhere in the 50 to 65 percent range, right? That means it's almost a coin flip if you have very dense breasts, if you walk in with a breast cancer, whether we're going to be able to see it on mammography or not. Um, so for that proportion of women, that can be a very significant risk of false negatives. It's still the best screening test for many women in that group because it offers a relatively good balance between false positives and false negatives, but it's definitely limited, more limited in, in, in women who have uh, very dense breast tissue. We worry, of course, about false positives too. We know that the risk of a false positive mammogram for a woman who has uh, 10 years of breast cancer screening between 40 and 50 can be as high as 60%, right? Meaning the chance of getting called back one of those years out of 10 years. The false positive doesn't necessarily mean a biopsy. It doesn't necessarily mean anything invasive. It just means getting that phone call. We need you to come back. We need you to take more pictures, right? Um, so the extra medical costs, the extra sleepless nights, the extra anxiety, all of the things that are associated with that are considered harms of mammography. So when we talk about risks and benefits, that's one of the things that definitely comes up. So shouldn't we have something better? Well, we should, but we don't. Um, right now, what we have is uh, mammography as the very best tool for screening for most women. Um, and there are some emerging adjuncts um, and on the horizon, some other screening tools that have a tremendous amount of promise. Screening ultrasound is something that we're looking at. The trouble with screening ultrasound is, again, this question of false positives, right? This is a highly operator-dependent study uh, with very uh, relatively high false positive rates, lots of callbacks, lots of benign biopsies. Um, so that tends to be a problem. Screening MRI is something we're using increasingly now to screen women who are at elevated lifetime risk for a variety of statistical reasons, primarily family history, but also other things like previous biopsies showing precancerous change. Screening MRI has a very high sensitivity, right? Walk in with a breast cancer, we're gonna find it, but a relatively high false positive rate, 20 to 25% in some studies, a little bit lower in our data uh, at Marin General, more like 15%, but still that's quite a lot of callbacks um, and potentially a lot of uh, invasive testing that's gonna turn out to be benign. This is the reason that screening MRI is not recommended for average risk women, right? Because the appropriate balance between their pretest probability of having the disease and the false positive rate doesn't really work out unless their risk is high enough. Um, thermography is a imaging study, an imaging modality that's really poorly studied. There's very little data. I think Dr. Gold Goldman went over the data that there is, but it's, there's very, really not much of it. It's not something that we routinely uh, recommend. Um, but what is coming along that's very interesting and new is what we call 3D mammography. This is also called tomosynthesis. Um, and that's now recommended as an option for women at average risk with dense breasts. And what it does is create a composite mammogram by taking the same picture of the breast that you get with a regular mammogram from 25 different angles. Now, this does have the side effect of increasing the radiation exposure 25-fold, but again, remembering that even 40 mammograms is less than a CT scan, for some women, that risk and benefit analysis is going to be appropriate. These studies increase the sensitivity of mammography quite a lot, um, for, especially for women with dense breasts. So that's something that we're starting to look at. The other take-home message here is that risk-based screening in breast cancer, as in many parts of medicine, is becoming the norm. Um, so we're really most interested in tailoring these screening approaches to individual risk. We really want to know who is at increased risk and who should we be doing more for, who is at lower risk, and we should be leaving them alone more.
All right. So how do we manage the risk factors for a healthy woman like this, right? So this patient has a couple of non-modifiable risk factors. She has dense breast tissue. She has a family history of breast cancer. Um, this is something that I, uh, I added to this talk because uh, I kept hearing it from my patients. It was driving me crazy um, that they thought that uh, deodorant, uh, primarily deodorant, but also underarm shaving were a risk factor for breast cancer. That turns out not to be the case. So there's some, actually some decent data about this. Um, there was a small epidemiologic study um, in Denmark looking at a case control study, looking at use of deodorants, use of antiperspirants, shaving habits, and so on that showed absolutely no difference. Um, a corollary to that that I often talk to my patients about because they ask me is putting your cell phone in your bra, and is that a risk factor for, for breast cancer? Um, and this is a, you know, a perfectly reasonable question to ask, right? Our cell phones do emit radiation. Um, they happen to emit non-ionizing radiation rather than ionizing radiation, which is what's responsible for DNA damage. Um, so mostly they create heat. Um, but it is something that I think we uh, were promoted to look at um, by some of the questions around this. And there have been several studies um, in Scandinavia, of course, where they do the very best epidemiologic work because they have so much data on so many people um, and a relatively homogenous population. Um, and there are several large prospective cohort studies there that show no link in particular between cell phone use and brain tumors, which is, of course, the area where people had the most proximity. Um, but there's also been no association with other types of cancers uh, either. So when we put all of these risk factors in context. Uh, one of the most important things to remember is that they don't all contribute the same amount to risk. Um, and this is a nice little busy graphic, but it shows you how risk factors can be stratified in terms of how much they contribute to risk. Um, and we really think of these things as being in three categories. They're the non-modifiable things, right? They're the things that you can't do anything about, your family history, your age, your previous medical history, things that may have happened to you. And then there are complex factors like reproductive choices. And we typically don't choose when we're going to have our children based on our breast cancer risk, although it does impact our breast cancer risk if we have our children later in life, um, breastfeeding and so on, um, oral contraceptive use. Uh, these things can potentially impact um, breast cancer risk, but you are not necessarily making those decisions based on that risk alone. And then there are modifiable risk factors, things that we work on daily in our clinics, uh, hormone replacement therapy use, activity level, body mass index, smoking, and alcohol use. Let's take a minute to talk about family history as a risk factor. This is a topic that you've seen in the headlines, right? Of course, the lovely Angelina Jolie came out as a, publicly as a BRCA mutation carrier and had a bilateral uh, risk-reducing mastectomy. Um, and that really brought this issue of hereditary risk um, into the public arena uh, for the first time. Um, and there's been a, a subsequent perception, of course, that it must be a very, very common thing and that everybody who gets breast cancer young has one of these mutations. The truth is that only about 5 to 10% of breast cancers are associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes caused by the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. Um, the vast majority of breast cancers are not caused by one of these hereditary syndromes. There are a variety of other hereditary syndromes that can also contribute to breast cancer risk that are significantly less common, um, but we do see families where there's an obvious predisposition to certain types of cancers. And so often we're sending those folks to genetic counseling and looking for, again, ways to better understand risk. Um, there are some red flags that we look for in terms of family history for uh, breast cancer risk in particular. We look for early onset bilateral cancers, certain subtypes of breast cancers, male breast cancers, and so on, that are big red flags for this kind of risk. Relatively speaking, this is a very unusual event. I do probably 50 BRCA tests a month, and I might get two positives. Um, so it's just not something that we see a lot of. So for people who don't have extremely elevated lifetime risk, um, but who might have some risk factors at play, what, how do we then put some kind of quantifiable, useful number on elevated risk. We do it through risk modeling. And this is something that's being more and more widely used in the screening setting um, because it's allowing us to do that risk stratification that we talked about, where we can look at an individual woman and say, not just your mammogram is normal, but also 
and your risk of developing breast cancer in the next 10 years is X percent, and then in the next 40 years is Y percent, and here are some of the things that we would recommend that you do or do differently. There are a bunch of different risk models. Some of them put people in sort of high, medium, and low categories. Others place people in 10-year risk groups or lifetime risk groups. Um, and it just helps us to be more sensible about not just how we interpret the mammogram that's in front of us, but what we recommend to people. The one you're looking at is the most commonly used risk model. This is called the Tyre Cusick model, after the two people who developed it, epidemiologists. Um, and they uh, showed pretty robust data looking at uh, the correlation between their estimates of lifetime risk. Um, they broke those groups, uh, broke those risk groups down and, and looked at actual outcomes um, in those groups. And we're able to show some pretty decent correlation in terms of the amount of lifetime risk that they could document uh, for those patients and the amount that their, uh, that their risk model generated. So this is what we use um, in, the, in the clinic. Um, so if we take somebody like our example patient, right, who is in her early 40s with a family history and some other risk factors, she's going to come up with a lifetime breast cancer risk of about 29%. Right? So there's a couple ways to slice and dice that number. It sounds like a big number. Right? This is over a statistical lifetime that goes out to 80. So this is over her, the next 48 years of her statistical lifetime. So that's well under 1% per year. And it's also somewhere around a 70% chance that she's never gonna get breast cancer. So I always remind my patients that there are many ways to look at breast cancer risk. Um, but that's a big enough number that it would be recommended to her that she have an annual breast MRI as a screening strategy, especially because she has dense breasts in addition to her annual mammogram. There are a few other lifestyle interventions that we recommend to people. The, uh, the big ones are um, maintaining a healthy weight, activity, and low-fat diet. And we'll talk for a second about the data we have for those. So low-fat diet data comes primarily from the Women's Interventional Nutrition Study, uh, which was a very big study that was completed in the mid-2000s, looking at a low-fat diet intervention and its impact on health outcomes, in particular breast cancer incidence and breast cancer recurrence. Um, and found that women on a low-fat diet had a significantly lower risk, in particular, of recurrence of their breast cancer um, and a, a lower risk of um, uh, primary cancers in the same group of women. Interestingly, this was a bigger effect in women whose original tumors were not hormonally sensitive compared to those who had hormonally sensitive tumors uh, originally, which tells us something, again, between the, about the relationship between fat in our diet, fat in our bodies, and estrogen production. Um, there is very little data to support specific supplement use, specific dietary guidelines, vegan diet, paleo diet, whatever you might, alkaline diet, you know, people come into my office with, on every one of these. Um, there's very little data to link any of those dietary approaches to lower risk of breast cancer or breast cancer recurrence. Um, and the bottom line, as I tell my patients, is we all know what we should be eating. We should be eating a plant-based diet that's mostly vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, low in saturated fat and low in processed sugar with low alcohol consumption. It's not complicated. Um, getting it to happen, of course, is a little bit more challenging. Um, we have a big office in our center that focuses on nutrition and wellness um, and really trying to promote uh, those, uh, those habits. Cardiovascular exercise is another big factor in terms of reduced risk of primary and recurrent breast cancer. So this is another thing that we work on with patients a lot. Um, there's study, studies are mostly small and were put together in a couple of meta-analyses, um, and they compared women who were given routine lifestyle advice compared to women who averaged no less than 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise a week, which is about three hours, um, and they had these women get up to 60% of their maximal heart rate, which is less than it sounds like. Um, it's about 220 minus your age. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a working heart rate, but it's not a running marathon heart rate. Um, and they found a three to four fold reduction in the risk of breast cancer recurrence in a group of survivors. Um, and then a similar, a slightly small, about two and a half fold reduction in the risk of primary cancers in a group of high risk women. Um, so we were able to really document the biggest of any of our interventions, our lifestyle interventions, decrease in risk factor around cardiovascular activity. 
Um, we've discussed the risks of uh, obesity and alcohol consumption. That's something that I recommend to a lot of my patients, so it will be recommended to this, to this patient. Um, and then the other uh, intervention that we sometimes talk about is vitamin D. There have been some small conflicting studies about the role of low vitamin D in breast cancer risk, and again, small and conflicting. Um, but because vitamin D uh, plays a really important role in maintenance of bone density in postmenopausal women, we do test for vitamin D levels and have women supplement um, up to a normal level if they're low. So these are just some of the things that I uh, have t as take-home messages for, uh, for my community. And I think these are very similar messages that you would give in San Francisco County, um, that personal risk is, uh, is an important factor when you think about a screening strategy, and that when women are asking themselves questions about how often should I have mammography, uh, you know, what should I be doing in terms of screening, what should I be doing in terms of lifestyle, knowing your own risk profiles can be very, very helpful. Um, modifying those modifiable risk, risk factors. And for most women, annual screening mammography really is still the best screening strategy. Um, but we're working on that, so stay tuned. Um, and that's the end. This is my reason to stay healthy. Um, and I'd like to thank you guys for uh, having me today. Thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Sir. Doctor, you live in a very well-informed community, I, I think, compared to others. Is that well-informed aspect a function of higher reporting than these other counties or other countries, just because you're doing a better job approaching this? And also, do your new patients come to you as a result of a screening of the whole population or as opposed to, uh, let's say, early warning signs they do themselves, self-examinations, and then they come to you with symptoms? Great. So I'm going to repeat your question because they asked me to do that. Um, so I believe you've asked me two questions. One is, uh, and correct me if I'm interpreting this uh, correctly, um, uh, is about detection bias. Is one of the reasons that the breast cancer rates are higher in Marin that we're finding more of them because people have better access to health care? Is that, that sort of what you're asking? Right. And then how are we finding breast cancers in Marin? Are they happen is it happening through screening or is it because people are coming in with symptoms? Um, Detection bias has been worked out of these statistics before we even look at them, really. Um, but yes, there is probably some of that in this country. So there's an argument about overdiagnosis in, in countries where screening mammography is the standard. Right? So we can look at breast cancer-specific mortality in those countries and show that the amount we're decreasing breast cancer specific mort mortality compared to non-screening countries is less than we would expect if every one of the cancers that we were detecting was a potential contributor to breast cancer specific mortality. Did that, yeah. did that compute? Okay. Um, so that means we are diagnosing and treating some breast cancers that were never in the group of those that might become life-threatening. And generally, that's because they're diagnosed in women who are older and who are going to die of something else before that breast cancer was going to become a problem, right? It can be very difficult to figure out who's who, right? When we detect a new breast cancer, is this one that we should have not detected and could have left alone? We don't know. Once we found it, we're sort of stuck with it. In the answer to your question about how breast cancers are detected, in particular in Marin, there's a relatively higher rate of screen detected breast cancers because it is a well-informed population. Um, the, actually, the rate of screen detected breast cancers is higher in San Francisco County because in Marin County, there are more people who decide not to be screened for a variety of health concern reasons, valid or not. Um, but still, compared to lower socioeconomic counties in various parts of California, we still have a higher rate of screen-detected disease. But I see women at all stages who find their breast cancer in all kinds of different ways. Yeah. Thank you for such an informative lecture. Um, you mentioned vitamin D. So the normal range is 30 to 100. So mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, do you stick around the, in the lower like 30s or, or do some physician would go really higher number. This is a great question, and actually there's quite a bit of debate in the literature right now about how to standardize vitamin D testing, um, because there's a, quite a lot of variation between labs and in different parts of the country as to how vitamin D levels are measured, how they're interpreted, and how they're reported. Um, so in different parts of the country, and even from hospital to hospital, you can have something that's considered normal, and then in another hospital is considered low. Um, so that's a problem that we have that has to do with standardization of testing and reporting. Um, 
here, the range of normal, or at least in our hospital and most of the hospitals in this region, is 30 to 100. Um, we like people to be in that normal range. I don't think there's enough data to support the practice of supplementing people up above 50. There have been a couple of small studies that suggested that there were some residual increased risk for various bad outcomes in that 30 to 50 range. But again, I think those studies weren't conclusive to begin with, and the issue of confusion around how vitamin D is actually tested and reported muddies the water a lot. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned alcohol uh, use and uh, decreasing it, have they ever differentiated uh, between whether alcohol was wine or whether it was a hard alcohol? Those studies are all done by consumed grams of alcohol, so that they're standardized, excuse me, they're standardized across methods of consumption, right? So the number of grams of alcohol can be calculated from, you know, a certain amount of wine, and rough correlations is that 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, and one ounce of hard liquor all have about the same number of grams of alcohol in them. So it's not the... What, what, what is in the alcohol in addition to the alcohol? Yeah, so when, in these studies, they, they do break down and look at you know, wine drinkers, beer drinkers, liquor drinkers, and they've never noticed any difference in risk between those groups. So the idea that the, what are the, what are the wine people call it? There's, there's some name for all the other chemicals that are in the wine besides the alcohol, you know, all, the, all the other substrates that are in there. There's no indication that different kinds of alcohol play a role in breast cancer recurrence and risk particularly. Now we know that some of the active compounds in red wine have vascular effects, um, in particular on the lining of our arteries. So that's not to say that there's no issue there. It's just to say that in studies looking at breast cancer risk in particular, there's never been any evidence that there's a difference. And that probably has to do with the fact that we think the causal relationship is between uh, is, is happening in the liver, right? So our liver processes our steroid hormones, including a protein called sex hormone binding globulin, which is responsible for ferrying our steroid hormones like estrogen and progesterone around our body. Um, and if you're keeping your liver really busy, it's not handling those other duties, right? So typically women who are consuming more alcohol have lower rates of circulating sex hormone binding globulins, higher rates of circulating free estrogen. So that's the hypothetical causal relationship. Yeah. When you say higher socioeconomic, and just kind of leave it out there, it seems like it could be almost anything that people at a higher social economic level do. I mean, sure. it's alcohol. Sure, yeah. So again, that's a very complex risk factor. Um, and often it appears in studies because it's something we can ask about. It's something quantifiable. Um, and easier in that sense to ask about than complex things like cultural factors, um, much more reliably reported than things like dietary factors. So I think the existence of that as a, as a data point um, is sort of an unfortunate side effect of how easy it is to find out. Um, and I think it's really too complex uh, as a risk factor to do much more than speculate about what all is packed into it. Yes. Is breast density a factor for screening or is it a factor for uh, cancer? Both. Both? Both, yes. So breast density increases breast cancer risk independent of other risk factors. Um, and that's something that, again, there's a lot of research going on around the role of breast density in breast cancer genesis um, and it has probably to do with some subtleties of the micro environment in the breast, um, levels of metabolic activity, uh, levels of cell turnover, and so on. Um, it's also a risk factor for false negative mammograms. Right. What exactly does it mean, breast density? Great question. So breast tissue is made up of two kinds of tissue fatty tissue and what we describe as fibroglandular tissue. And the fibroglandular tissue has the milk making tissue in it supported by a dense fibrous support structure. The ratio between those two is a genetic factor like eye color. 
Some people have mostly fatty tissue and not very much fibroglandular tissue. Other people have it the opposite way. Most people are somewhere in between. Now, having less fibroglandular tissue doesn't mean your breasts don't work well in terms of milk production. Usually they work just fine. It's just an it's just a feature of the way people are put together. Some people have very fibrous breasts. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about breast density. It's how fibrous the breast is compared to the amount of fatty tissue. So it could be a factor in reading the, the, the picture. That's right, that's right. The mammograms are harder to interpret. One of my colleagues describes it as looking for a polar bear in a snowstorm. <laughs> okay. and, and it could also indicate more cancerous tendencies? Again, we believe that the link between breast density and increased breast cancer risk is happening at the micro environment. So it's really down on the cellular level in the breast. And again, you know, there are, there are bench researchers out there who are more informed about that than I am. Um, I think there's not been consensus about what exactly is going on in the micro environment that is driving that. Um, but that's really where we're looking. Um, when you talked about the Women's Health Initiative and the, the HRT the mm -hmm. replacement, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the progesterone, the women who had the progesterone were mm -hmm. the ones who saw more cancer. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's that's a million dollar question. Okay. Part two is just your thoughts on bioidentical hormones versus the synthetic yeah. stuff. So the sorry, I'm supposed to be repeating people's questions. The um, the question was about um, why combined hormone replacement therapy plays a role in uh, breast cancer risk, whereas estrogen alone does not. And then what uh, what's going on with the whole bioidentical thing? Um, so we don't know why women who take combined hormone replacement therapy have this statistical uptick in their breast cancer risk compared to women who take estrogen alone. Again, hypothetically, the risk probably has to do with the way that those two hormones potentiate each other's effect in the tissue. Almost all breast cancer cells that express estrogen receptors also express progesterone receptors. So, and then there are, there are a population of cells in the breast that express neither, right? So we have to assume that there's some complex interplay between those. And you only have to look at the way the levels of, the, of those hormones uh, different in different parts of the menstrual cycle during the normal reproductive cycle to know that they play a complex game in the normal reproductive years and they have very important roles to play both in the normal development of the breast during puberty and the development of the breast into a lactational organ should it become so at the appropriate time. Right. So the assumption is that those two hormones together are making more genetic changes um, or promoting more genetic changes in the breast rather than just estrogen alone. Okay. Oh, and bioidenticals. Um, there is zero data to suggest that bioidenticals are safer than other, than, you know, one type of estrogen. Um, the idea here, for those who are not familiar with the idea of bioidenticals, is that um, most of the hormone replacement therapy that was originally given was either um, a combination of different types of estrogens that were derived from horse urine, actually, um, or they were synthetic estrogens like estradiol. Um, and the idea of bioidenticals was that we should give back a combination of different kinds of estrogens, estradiol, estrone, estradione, et cetera, that more closely mimic the normal balance in the body because we make all of those different kinds of estrogens. Um, because of the difficulties with standardizing um, that kind of compounding um, and the very low likelihood that there's really a difference. There's never been a real randomized study um, looking at the, yeah, so there's never been a real randomized study looking at the, the big outcomes that we care about. One of the problems is that you have to randomize a huge number of women to do X or Y in order to be able to measure a difference in something like breast cancer risk, right? You can't do a study in 100 women and expect to see a difference. It has to be 100,000, 300,000, a million women to see the difference. And so when you're dealing with uh, things that are compounded on the private market that are very expensive, you're just not going to see that kind of data being generated. Right? So we just don't have data to suggest that it's safer. Yeah? How about cancers in women 
postmenopausal, but they're elderly cancer. So I'm thinking about women in their 80s and 90s who develop breast cancer. Do we even know whether that is a whole other series of causative factors? Um, I think the answer to your question is really best put in context of the general relationship between aging and increased risk for cancer, right? So all kinds of cancers become more common as we age. We actually see a slight decrease in the overall incidence of breast cancers in women in their 80s and 90s just because there are fewer women running around in their 80s and 90s. But just in, on an individual level, our risk continues to go up over our lifetime. Um, so all elderly people are at increased risk for all kinds of cancers. Um, it's not a different animal in elderly women, although generally we're seeing lower grade, less aggressive looking cancers in older women. That's a generalization and you'll see lots of exceptions. The difference really is in how we approach them clinically because when we look at 20 and 30 year disease free survival numbers, those are meaningless to somebody who's 89, right? We don't care if she's gonna be disease free in 30 years, right? it's, except if she's you know, the miraculous Italian woman who's 100 and is running around at 116, right? 99.99% of us are not gonna see 116, right? So we manage those women differently because we care much more about their five and 10 year disease free outcomes and their quality of life in the shorter term than we do about their 20 year disease free survival. So we're doing things differently clinically in that population. Biologically, it's not that different from what we're seeing in women in their 50s and 60s. Yeah. Sure, we do a lot less, right? So we do a lot fewer mastectomies. We do more lumpectomies. Um, we do a lot less radiation, right? So lumpectomy and radiation typically go together for management of early stage breast cancers, but the role of radiation is to decrease 15, 20, and 25 year recurrence rates, right? So an 89 year old, we're just not gonna radiate them unless we see a real benefit in the next five years, right? So for somebody with very high risk disease, maybe you would consider it. But for most women who have low risk disease, you're just gonna leave them alone. Um, we look at the benefit of chemotherapy in cases where it might be indicated differently for that same reason. Older people are at significantly higher risk for treatment related complications and get significantly less benefit because they're only getting that benefit over the next five to 10 years. So those are just some examples. Sure, so we see that in families where we see this thing that we call hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So women who carry BRCA1 and 2 mutations are at markedly higher risk for both breast and ovarian cancer to the tune of about 80% risk of breast cancer in their lifetime and 40% risk of ovarian cancer. So those are massive numbers compared to an average woman whose risk is 12% for breast cancer and 1% for ovarian cancer. Outside of BRCA families, we see essentially no link, right? So women who have had ovarian cancer, if they have managed to dodge the bullet, since that's a particularly nasty thing to have, generally do not have an increased risk of breast cancer and vice versa. Um, so the link really has to do with the way that BRCA1 and 2 are preferentially expressed in hormonally sensitive tissues in our body. Um, most breast cancers uh, are not linked to ovarian cancer risk. Is, it, is that BRAC, is it the same cancer manifesting in both areas? Or they no. Completely different, just yeah, so what's happening in that case is that you're dealing with an underlying predisposition, an inherited predisposition, a genetic weakness that makes it more likely that, that tissue in the breast or ovary and in some other parts of the body is going to become cancerous because the cells are less able to defend themselves against genetic damage. So regardless of the type of cancer or the geography. That's right. And that's true in all the cells in the body. It's just that that mutation is preferentially expressed in hormonally sensitive tissue. Yeah. What about the new recommendation for three years screening versus 
Sure. So um, I, I think you, you may be conflating a little bit the changing recommendations for pap smears with the changing recommendations for mammograms. So the, the recent recommendations for mammograms are every one to two years, and then there's some debate about whether we should start at 40 or start at 50, right? Um, and the thing about whether you've been clean for 10 years or not, that's a pap smear guideline thing. Um, so um, so we, that's an ongoing debate. I know you guys heard some about that last week. Um, and it really has to do with a debate about the relative harms of mammography. In other words, how much does it really hurt people to have a false positive mammogram? And the interpretation of that data is a subject of a lot of angry debate, frankly, in the academic community. Because from the epidemiologic perspective, there's a lot of harm in that, right? There's a lot of medical cost. There's a lot of potential for, for minor complications, hematomas, infections, pain, distress, all of those things. And so when the US Preventative Services Task Force came out with their recommendations around mammography, they gave a lot of weight to those harms. And they said, you know, the benefits of mammography are largely undisputed, right? Although there's the large Canadian study that suggested that there was no benefit, that study was extremely poorly designed and that data has very little validity. They actually threw it out when they, when they did the Preventive Services Task Force recommendations. They gave preferential weight to these harms because they said from an epidemiologic perspective, we're doing a lot of damage too, and how can we start to reduce that damage? And one of the ways that you can create fewer false positives and fewer unnecessary interventions is by doing fewer mammograms. And so they were trying to find a sweet spot where they were still getting some of the mortality reduction of the screening strategies, but reducing the false positive rate. And what they came up with, which was start at 50 and screen every two years until 75, was an attempt to decrease the false positives and harms associated with mammography, decrease the risk of overdiagnosis and so on. Unfortunately, I think that there's a real debate to be had that wasn't had at the time that those recommendations came out about how we should value um, the actual benefits, in particular in women between 40 and 50. Um, because if you look at just the number of breast cancers that you're gonna diagnose in that age range, or the number of women's lives you're gonna save, you're gonna find a small number because under 10% of breast cancers are diagnosed under 50. But if you look at the number of years life saved, if you look at the number of productive years life saved, you're actually doing more good screening women between 40 and 50 than you are screening women between 70 and 80. Um, so there's, there's a lot of debate about how the benefits and harms were framed and whether that was really appropriate. And PET scan screening? Um, PET screening is not something that I think we're really looking at. PET has a lot, involves a lot of radiation. We're looking at a few different types of new breast imaging, um, uh, gamma imaging and something called molecular imaging. Um, so there are some new uh, things coming down the pike, um, but PET scans are not a good screening tool really for anything. They're a diagnostic test because they involve a whopping dose of radiation. Yes, we know that. We can, you know, this old expression, we can send a guy to the moon, but we can't make uh, a mammography machine that is at least anatomically, you know, designed. And is there any, any, any effort at all being paid to making those things any more comfortable? Uh, yes, I mean, I think there are a lot of people working on both new screening technologies and making mammography better and more comfortable and so on. And the Tomo machines are actually significantly more comfortable, so women tell me. Um, but, um, you know, the tricky thing about mammography is that it's a flat plate, right? So the more squish you get, the better image you get. The less you squish, the more you're going to have false negatives and false positives because you're going to have a harder time interpreting the image. So you're, you're dealing with some test limitations. And in order to, to get around that and get a really comfortable breast screening test, we're going to have to go to something other than mammography. As I say, that, that work is being done, but we're a little ways off. Yeah. It was mentioned about the BRCA and um, 
ovarian and breast cancer. And I was wondering, do you see a combination of breast cancer and melanoma? Uh, BRCA families do have a higher risk of melanoma among other types of cancers in addition to breast and ovarian cancer. Yes. Do you, in your practice, do you see that kind of combination of cases, patients has? Outside of families with known genetic mutations, generally not. But with the positive uh, BRCA, do, do you actually see that combination? Definitely that's something we see clinically in BRCA families. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I was curious whether there have been any studies of the impact of a sedentary lifestyle. There's been some recent data indicating that even intermittent cardiovascular exercise in the midst of an otherwise sedentary lifestyle is associated with a higher mortality. Does that, I mean, that would be typically associated with high socioeconomic status. You don't have to have manual labor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The studies that we have looking at the relationship between exercise and breast cancer outcomes are all, are, are all intervention studies about exercise. So it's hard to randomize people to be sedentary. Again, you know, when you talk about what can you ask people to do in an experimental setting, um, what they're comparing is people who are getting an intervention to do exercise um, compared to people who are just allowed to do whatever they want. So there's presumably a certain proportion of people in the do whatever you want groups who are entirely sedentary and a population in that group who are intermittently active. And there may be some who are also quite active in that group too. The idea is just that they're a control group and that the intervention group is people that you're asking to do specific things. You know, it's hard to ask people to do something that we know is bad for them. Like it's not good for you to be sedentary. So we can't randomize you to that as an experimental arm. Right? We have to do something that we know is good for you, exercise, um, and then compare that to what people were doing without any prompting. So that's the data that we have. I, I mean, I was curious more in terms of, you know, for example, comparison of the person with a desk job and the person who has a job that requires minimal labor. Again, that, we don't really have that data, right? So when we're looking for a difference in outcomes, um, we're usually trying to control a lot of the other variables and not just sort of surveying people to see what they do for a living. That's usually not going to be clean enough data to give us any meaningful look at outcomes. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah I would think that the, the people in Marin County would probably eat more organic food and maybe um, a better diet than say other areas. So that would be contrary to does a good diet causes. Right, so again, you know, the studies that we have around the role of nutrition in uh, breast cancer risk are minimal, right? In, part, in large part because it's very difficult to study those things, right? Ask people what they eat and you'll get all kinds of answers that bear no relationship to reality. Um, ask people to control what they eat and it's, you're just gonna have a lot of trouble getting the outcomes that you're going after. Um, so besides a low fat diet, which we do have some good data about, which we talked about, um, we don't have a lot of data suggesting that organic versus non-organic food impacts breast cancer incidence or outcomes. Yeah. So what, what are the findings on exercise and cardio? Sure. So, um, the, the data that I just went over looks at the um, improvement in um, breast cancer recurrence, so about a three to four-fold decrease in breast cancer recurrence in women who were exercising 150 minutes a week or more, and a two-and-a-half-fold decrease in the risk of primary occurrence. Fold decrease in the risk of primary recurrence. So it makes a really big difference. Um, and again, these women weren't exercising. They weren't running marathons. They were exercising at 60% of their maximal heart rate for three hours a week, which is what we would consider moderate. Yeah? OK, I can take other questions after uh, break. Thanks, everybody.